I say most times. You gotta push your foot. Flesh don't want to do nothing. Except for what it wants to do. Flesh wants to stay at home, flesh wants to hide and telling you this is the greatest hour of the church. That is in its entire history, this is the greatest hour of the church. He said, Well, it seems like the other side is winning. Well, we know he's a liar. So he's just lying anyway. Amen. This is the greatest hour of the church in Jesus' name. Amen. We we have very, very dear and close friends to us that are here today. And we're so thankful that they're here. Amen. Family is with them. Let me also say that uh, we have one of our family members we haven't seen in a while. Miss Jenna is here today. We're so glad that she's here. We love her. Stephen Elvis, good to see you again, sir. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. And then we got all these tailors. We got all these tailors. I see mom and dad coming in. Let's give them a hand. How many of you believe in restoration? Now, God's brand and version of restoration is somewhat different than ours. Uh, if if you care to go and read the book of Job, and it's not always the easiest book to read, you'll read about how somebody fell from the top all the way to the bottom. But please don't stop before you get to the end. Because at the end of that book, you will see that not only did God bring him back to the top, but God established a new standard, a new top, a higher dimension. And he took his man all the way back up to that new place. And only God can do that. Humble yourselves, therefore, into the mighty hand of God. And he, God, will exalt you in due time, in the right season. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. And then verse 7 says, cast all your cares on. I learned through humility, through humbling myself, and letting God be the one that exalts me to cast all my cares on. Amen. All of my cares are cast on Him. I don't have to carry it anymore. It belongs to Him. All I've got to do is stay full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I want you, Taylor, to come today. Amen. And He is going to greet you today. I'm going to wipe this off for you. So, you know, just in case I got some.
because of y'all prayers in powerhouse, I'm back on top as the chief of police. So what the enemy meant for bad, God turned it for good. I'm just so thankful, and I'm gonna say this right here, and I'm gonna sit down. Some of you, the enemy wants to fight you right now and attack you and, and make you feel like that you can't make it. Gonna throw all kind of things against you. But I'm a living witness. Look at me on this stage today. You can do all things through Christ who's speaking. You gotta believe it. You gotta speak with authority. You gotta let the devil know he's in the house. The devil tries to slip my back. I'm here today in my back. I thank God for him. I thank God for him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for not allowing him. To steal my joy. He might have knocked me down, but I got up. I got up and I kept God back. I kept the praying. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.
You die. I don't know if y'all understand how swimming works and water. John told me not too long ago that he almost drowned in about 16 inches of water. What did you say it was? About six inches. Yeah. About six inches of water. I don't even know how that's possible. Sand, man. Sand. Kneel. You can just kneel if you want to. Six inches of water. But you know when you get discombobulated, when you, when you, when you just panic or you get thrown off or whatever, I, I found out when I officially became an old man, because at our community pool a few years ago in, in North Carolina, they got that rope, you know, that goes across the uh, shallow section and the deep section, and I just flipped over that rope in the water, just not out of it, just in the water. I wasn't trying to be crazy. I just grabbed the rope and I flipped over. Y'all, I got so dizzy. And I thought I was swimming up and I was swimming down. John, I know exactly how you felt. Mine was about three feet of water, but whatever. Deep calleth unto deep. He just called. He said, well, I don't know if I can swim that long. Well, sometimes you got to float. Sometimes you got to tread water. And then sometimes the Lord sends rescue. And all of a sudden you'll look around and be like, I don't even know how I got through that. I don't even know how I made it through that. Deep is calling. Lord bless you. Can you see me? Ela, I love you. It's good to see you. In India, in India, there is a need for clean drinking water. Along with a lot of other places on planet Earth today, we take for granted here in our country that you pretty much can find clean drinking water anywhere. There is the Bengal Basin, the Ganges River, or the Ganges River. There's the Delta. Groundwater is separated by 240 plus feet of, feet of clay. Just let me give you this story before I go on. The first aquifer is groundwater. The second aquifer is arsenic traced as pollution. Pollution is a byproduct of the reduction of sedimentary iron ox hydroxide. Don't have a clue what any of that means, except for it's important. Five times the WHO allowed a mount for clean drinking water. Too much of a good thing is not necessarily a good thing. The right amount of it is great. Clean water sets at the third aquifer that is as much as 350 feet below the surface. That's deep. Our well out here that puts water into this building is about 100 to 150 feet. We have a water fountain by the front door. I do not suggest drinking out of it. It's totally, completely up to you. I don't think it'll kill you, but whatever. We should have a sign up there that says drink at your own risk. But code required that there be a water fountain there, so we put one there. We do have bottled water if you need that, and that may be a little bit cleaner, I'm not sure. In order to get a safe well, you have to drill a hole through the first two aquifers, past the 240 feet of clay to the third aquifer where the safe water is just waiting, just sitting there. There are plenty of wells everywhere, but no healthy water. Now, Jesus sits down in John chapter 4 on a well outside the city of Samaria. The woman came to get water out of that well. They even had a conversation about the well. They talked about that well, and they talked about Jacob, their father, she began to mention. He dug this well. Of course, Jacob got a new name after he wrestled the angel. He became Israel. Right? The beloved of God. And of course, we are all Israel. If you're born again of water and the spirit, you are a spiritual Hebrew of the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who became Israel. And so they, they had this conversation about the well and, and who dug it. And, the, and she was basically saying, this is our well. We have the right to this water because of our father, Jacob. There are wells that don't go deep enough, and there's no seal placed in the hole to stop the cross-contamination between the three aquifers and the levels of water. 
The government paid to have the wells dug, but then there were payoffs for government officials and contractors that caused the wells to only go 200 feet deep. Now, according to the stats that I just read, 200 feet is not going to cut it. 200 feet leaves you in the arsenic water. They needed 350 at least. And government officials were paid to stop at 200. Why? Why would somebody want it to stop where it's poisonous? Why? 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 Why would anybody in this world want it to stop? Be willing to pay large sums of money to have that water stop where it's not healthy. Why? I submit to you today that this story is a very clear and Michelangelo type painting of what religion is in the world. It's a well that only goes 200 feet deep. Man, for whatever reason, has decided that we're not going to go any deeper than this. They will readily read the word of God. They'll go to uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts. They'll begin to read through the epistles. And they will admit that the early church had a deeper well. Then when you bring up and you say, well, if they had a deeper well, how come we don't? Today have that well at that same depth. And this is what you will consistently hear. That's not for us today. Jesus Christ, the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. So if we're living in the forever from the early church, then Jesus hasn't changed. The well, the, I, I listen you could, you could, they used to, to fill wells. The enemies would do this. They would, they would come and they would pour sand and, and all kinds of debris. And, and sometimes, because they didn't have time to, to fill it in with, with dirt and sand and whatever, they would just throw a dead animal into it to try to poison it. So nobody can get life from that. Jesus is sitting at this very deep well with this woman in Samaria. He's having this conversation with her. And, he begins to talk to her about a deeper way. He begins to have this conversation with, how many of you remember when you first began to hear that there was a deeper well? Remember you came to Jesus, you had your little religious mindset, and you were raised in a certain denomination, and you had a certain label on you in a certain religion, and I thank God for it. But guess what? The end of that well, where the water sits, it's too much of a good thing. It's too much of a good thing. There's something sitting down about 350 feet that is pure and it's clean. Jesus described it to the woman as a well that never runs dry. Come on, somebody. And it's a well of life springing up. Springing up. So, in other words, the deeper you go, something else starts to come back up. These Inferior wells cause sickness and death to animals and to humans as well. That They have no choice. They have to drink from them because there's no other choice. Knowing that I'm drinking cross-contaminated water, knowing that I can't drink too much of this and I've got to be careful about how much I take in because it, it, too much of it will kill me. Those of you that have ever taken a trip south on the border, I have not. I, I went to Tijuana one time just to have lunch with my uncle back in the day and then came back over. And, uh, and he, of course, wouldn't let me drink it in the water there. I learned right then as a young boy that you don't drink the local water in Mexico. I think it's called Montezuma's Revenge is what they call it. You will begin to have violent bouts of stuff that you don't ever want to have violent bouts of. Anybody get a drink? Okay. Become very, very sick. And yet this is the water that these people have to drink. Now a friend of mine was down there preaching a revival and doing a missions trip down there. And he was standing in the middle of the street. He was there walking down the middle of the street. And all of a sudden the, the missionaries called him for him and, and said, hey, 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 come over here. Come over here. Hurry, hurry. Come over here. And he didn't know why. And he went over to join him. And, and, and he said, what's going on? He said, you see that water coming down the street? 
He's like, yeah. He said, that's not water. Only. That's our sewage. And every day at this time, it runs down and covers these streets. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not living there. Not physically and not spiritually. I'm not living with that mess running by my feet. You go down into the Keys, Key West, and into the Caribbean, and you'll find that you can just stare down into the water. It's like looking through a window. You can see all the way to the bottom. Fish all swimming around. You don't even have to snorkel. John, no worries. You don't even have to get off the boat. You can just look down or look off the end of a pier, and you can just look straight down the water, see every kind of fish swimming by and what have you. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. You get out further and further and further and further and further, and still you can just see all the way down. But at some point, you're going to get into the deep waters, and you're not going to be able to see very far. How many of you know that faith is in the dark? I'll go ahead and use him today. We hadn't known him for too long, and he came here because we were showing appreciation to uh, the, the chief of police that were in the area. You were the only chief that actually came, was able to come to the service. We had some paramedics that came, and then he came in and, and I met him for the first time that day and uh, had him come up and greet the congregation. Mom, Dad, you did a good job because right off the bat, I knew he was raised in a godly home. Right off the bat. And it was in him. You can't get away from that. And probably some influence of some grandparents, too. I heard it. I felt it. But anyway, he gets up, he greets everybody, tells them this, that, and the other. I had no idea or not, no clue what was going on in his life. Zero, zip, nothing. But I remember stopping him at the, we didn't have these new walls up yet, at that back wall back there. I stopped him. He was, getting, he was trying to get out of here. But I got to say, hold up now, hold up, hold up. I need you. He's like, okay, what's up? I said, I need you. I started talking to him about, some of the things that the Lord has shared with me about things that God wants to do in this area. And I said, but I cannot do it alone. I need you. I need you to help me. I need you to come and get connected with me and help me. So he said, okay. He said, right then he said, okay. And he left. What he doesn't know is that prayer followed you. You may have left this building, but there's a whole lot that left this building with you. Again, I had no clue what was going on in his life, had not met his wife, had not met his beautiful children. Miss Kayla, Madison, Tristan, Timothy B. Had not met any of them. And that day was coming. That was somewhere around 9-11. And then that uh, All Nation Sunday in October, he came back. Again, alone. I hadn't met anybody else yet. He came back. And I've got some good pictures from that service. Right across the aisle, back where uh, Sarah's at, God filled him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Yes. He had those victorious arms up in the air. Still didn't really know anything that was going on in his life. Hadn't met his folks yet. Hadn't really met anybody yet. And uh, but, but it was just shallow water at this point. It takes time. It takes work. You imagine how long it takes to dig 350 feet down? It takes time. And so we we just continue talking. We'd have lunch. I'm all about eating. So we'd meet. We'd eat. You know, we'd, we'd, we'd have lunch. We'd go to Chipotle and different places and hang out and talk and whatever. And I kept hearing about how wonderful Renata is and all these children and everything is great and wonderful. And, and boy, he was painting a good picture. Good picture. And uh, had a little Picasso in him, making it look real good. And we just kept building our relationship and talking and what have you. And, and kept praying and kept believing that everything was going to, uh, this is part of God's plan and God's purpose. And of course, I could have this conversation here about everybody in this room and how God connected us in the kingdom. We just began to dig. You know, sometimes when you're digging, you run into stuff. Sometimes when you're digging, you run into stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm the kind of person, when I put a shovel on the ground and it's immediately hard, I need to begin to inform my wife, can we plant this somewhere else? <laughs> can we find some soft soil somewhere and, uh, but sometimes it's got to be planted right there, right there. And it takes a lot of effort to get through different things to be able to plant there, but that's exactly where it needs to be. That's where it needs to be. And so God filled him with the Holy Ghost, and God filled him with the Holy Ghost. I'm a witness. I was standing right there. I was, I was, I was actually talking to somebody that was uh, a man, young man that was bound by uh, heroin addiction, and all of a sudden somebody was clutching and grabbing the back of my shoulder and I turned around to her wife and she's like, look at you, Kayla. <laughs> and Sister 
Sister Ray Long Tramp was here, and she was standing barefoot on one of those chairs because he's a pretty tall fella. And she had her hand on his head, and God was filling him with the Spirit. And, and the evidence that is in the Word of God began to come out of the abundance of his heart, bypassed his natural mind, and God began to speak through him. He left that day excited, joyful, just things are good, things are great. We move forward to January. I'm upstairs praying, and oh, how I miss the upper room. I'm upstairs praying, and that was the day I got to meet the whole crew. And I was praying up there, and I, I, the door opened, and I glanced over there. You know I check and see when y'all get to prayer, right? <laughs> I'm always watching. The door opened up, and in walks my wife, and behind her is Chief Taylor, and he's got his, his whole family. And so I started making my way over there. I wanted to greet them, and she was just kind of giving them a tour. And all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost about broke Taylor in half. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know if they had had pre-service prayer in their car before they got here. If they'd been on a fast before that. I didn't know what was going on. All I know is that the Holy Ghost started dealing with Taylor. And she's bent over and she's heaving and she's praying and the power of God's all over her. And her parents are just kind of standing there. Jesus, Jesus, hallelujah, praise God. We're standing there and hallelujah, praise God. Her siblings, I think we're backing up a little bit. Whatever's on her, I hope it don't get on me. And I'm not been very you, baby girl. But it was a God thing. Because I remember Mama telling me right then, he said, I've taken my daughter to a lot of church services. And I've never seen her like this. She told me, I think we just found our church. But the power of God just walking into the prayer room could impact our baby like that. It got deep. It got a little deeper that day. It got a little bit deeper. And then sometimes the enemy comes along. I remember talking to Cameron not too long ago. And we were talking about the different things that fall in the river that can hinder God's flow and God's process. The trees fall and sometimes man tries to put different dams up and humanity, religion, and what have you. And we ran into one of them. This man will tell you, he didn't take the time to tell it all today, but he will tell you that all of the hell that was unleashed in his world was all self-inflicted. All self-inflicted. Pure human choice. Anybody? I mean, we'd like to all call the devil over and be like, look what you did to my life. And then he'd be like, you chose me. I just put it out there. I just let you look at the world for a little while and you had to choose it. But guess what didn't happen? The well didn't get filled in. Just give me a second here. The well didn't get filled in. And I'm telling you today, this thing has dug deep all the way down to the youngest. And now sitting behind them, the well got started a long time ago. And I'd like to have that conversation about how far back it goes. And look, there's even more here today that want to be baptized in Jesus' name. So the well just keeps getting deeper and deeper. I remember him coming and he's like, Pastor, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And we're still early in our relationship knowing each other. I don't know what to do. I remember sitting down with him and his wife. And after we had that conversation, I told him, I said, boy, you in trouble. You are in trouble. He said, I know, I know, I know. I said, she is mad. I mean, like, mad. And I, guys, when she gets mad, somebody said it at the wedding yesterday. That dude's going to wind up living in the attic. <laughs> That's in the book. You're going to be on a housetop. Don't, nobody want to be in there when mama's mad. And she was mad. And she had a right to be mad. She was so upset. And then it starts trickling down. See, the enemy, he's like, if I can keep them at 200 feet, I'll poison that hole. 